All right, Calvinist Boo Crew. We've got friends in the house. We've got here J.C. Bear, and I am hanging out with my dear friend, Bradster. And Bradster, what a day to be alive. This is a day of God's blessing. This is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. How are you, my brother? It's always good to be here with my Boo Crew brother, and I would never want to be somewhere else at these precious times, my friend. How are you doing today? Well, as our good friend Drew Out would say, I'm doing better than I deserve. <laughs> now, we have a, a chance today to follow up on a series that we have been going through as a Boo Crew, and it's slightly polemical, of course. And, and what I mean by that is clearly we go through this Asimov's Guide to the, to the Bible as an example of an atheist, of a non-believing commentary on the Holy Scriptures. And so as Christians, of course, we're going to be polemical. There are going to be places where we disagree. But having said that, again, we're grateful that Professor Asimov has put his thoughts in writing. So that's one of the things to have, is to have this systematic, well-thought-out, orderly discussion. And so for us to be able to take his commentary and reflect, react to it, and provide our own polemics. Many times a critic will start criticizing the the thing that the other person has provided, and by the end of it, there's nothing left but holes. And you got to be careful with that, because as a critic, we stand on the text that we're criticizing. And what does that mean? We have the chance to exist and talk and have this show because of the capabilities of the person we're criticizing. And that means that the critic ought to have a, some degree of facility with, with the subject at hand, and then B, some degree of respect for the person whose ideas he, he's criticizing. And I certainly have that here with Professor Asimov. We're going to disagree with him and, on, on some key issues, and we're going to point out how, in some senses, he embodies the kinds of mistakes that so many non-believing critics make when they think about the Bible. But we are standing in a position to do that because of his skill in writing this commentary. With that out of mind and, and out of spoken out of the mouth there to establish where we're coming from, Bradster, how's it looking for your end? How is the beginning of your week going? Well, the first thing we have to keep in mind is when it says Holy Bible, you have to assume Bible without the Holy part as a plug-in because we have to do that in order to come up with something that it's not talking about. It's either something that it's not talking about and this is okay on the side or this is what it claims to be. Those are obviously our two conclusions and you get this from the Bible itself all throughout the Bible. When it says in the Gospel of Matthew in the seventh chapter to enter the narrow gate and then it talks about the broad way. One thing we know for sure is the scriptures give us two paths, and I would hope to stir you into the right one, to encourage you to come along the believing side of the fence, because I'm telling you, that's where you actually get the narrative, because we don't have a narrative without the holy in the Bible. And with that, I'll throw it back to you, brother. Thank you, my friend. We're going to read from uh, Professor Asimov's section on Barat in his commentary on Genesis. And let's just get into the text. The professor says, if one adds up the ages of the antediluvian patriarchs at the time of the birth of their sons, one finds that Noah was born 1,056 years after the creation of about 3,000 BC, accepting Bishop Usher's figures. When he was 600 years old, that is, about 2,400 BC, there came the flood. This, according to the Bible, was a worldwide deluge. But there is no record of any such phenomenon, of course. The Egyptian civilization, for instance, was in a particularly flourishing state at this very time and was building its pyramid. Nor do the Egyptian records speak of any floods other than the annual overflow of the Nile, as far as we know. Now, we're going to continue here, Bradster, but I just want to point out that Professor Asimov does what most modern critics do, which is he puts the Bible, the text of the Bible, under his microscope, and he examines it, and he sits over it in judgment, 
evaluating its claims, making assessments of this, trying to harmonize how that might work with something else. And I think that we as believers have to keep constantly pointing out because our non-believing friends keep constantly missing it. The Bible is not a text that promotes such a view of itself. And so with that in mind, Professor Asimov makes an interesting conjoinder that many non-believers make in order to make an anti-biblical view. And here's what it is. Asimov talks about the flood happening in about 2400 BC. Now, where does he get those numbers? He gets them from Bishop Usher. Now, nothing wrong with thinking about Bishop Usher's numbers, but just remember that that's an extra biblical conclusion. The Bible itself doesn't give us those dates. And so we have to we have to just start with by saying the obvious. If the Bible doesn't stand on a particular date, then asking the Bible to stand on a particular date is not wise. Now, even if that is, quote-unquote, the correct date, which I think is an extra-biblical question, he says this. He says, according to the Bible, the flood was a worldwide deluge, but there is no record of any such phenomenon, of course. Well, hello? He's reading the record of such a phenomenon. Why is it that the unbelieving critic cannot see past his nose to spite his face? He brings to the text, there is no record of any such phenomenon, therefore we've got to question the Bible. That's not true. The Bible is a record of such a phenomenon. Now he's going to talk about the Egyptian civilization, and he doesn't have any Egyptian records that talk about floods on such a scale. Well, okay, do, do we expect that he would? And do we have this idea that unless the Egyptian records corroborate, that we can dismiss it? First of all, do we have a comprehensive view of ancient Egyptian history in terms of records? Look, I'm not an Egyptologist, but I have scratched a little bit at the sides. I don't know any Egyptologist who thinks we have anything approaching comprehensive historical records of this time period. And yet, what does Professor Asimov allow himself to do? He allows himself to be the arbiter of whether the Bible's idea, and he doesn't even get that right because it's, of course, based on an extra-biblical figure for the flood. But then on top of that, he, he misses the whole point that this is not the text that supports that kind of analysis. We don't ask ourselves and look inside to ourselves and say, what's the truth about these conflicting reports? No, we look at the Bible to provide us with the very thing that we lack. So let me throw that over to you, Bradster. Do you, how do you see that happening in a lot of the uh, interactions you have with other people about topics like this? Well, we even get in Christianity people talking about this flood being a local flood instead of, I, I know, it's weird, but instead of a global flood. But I do applaud the man for acknowledging that the Bible does teach a global flood here. That's very faithful to the text. And you would have to be faithful to the text to acknowledge that reading. Now, my contention, my question would be this. What makes me favor Egyptian sources over what the biblical source would actually be, even if it was in this age or this time period? For me, I think that that is showing what we would call bias against what is being written here. I don't see why we're going to say, well— Let's trust the Egyptians' perspective, point of view, history lesson, so to speak, whatever you want to call it, over what is written here to be God's, that we have, in fact, had multiple historical claims come true. And we wouldn't even have known about these historical claims if it wasn't for the Bible first telling about them coming through. And with that, I'll pass it back over to you, J.C. the Bear. Thank you, brother. Let me continue reading how Professor Asimov develops this. So he starts off with saying there is no global flood. I think that is suspect, but then he continues. This is not to say, however, that the biblical story of the flood was not based on some actual but local flood in Sumerian history. You're going to see this over and over again, Bradster. Oh, the Bible, it's just it's captive to its Sumerian history origins. Now the professor continues, Sumeria was a flat land between two large rivers. As is true of any large river, we have only to think of our own Missouri and Mississippi rivers. Unusual rises will bring about flooding conditions. 
in a country as flat as Sumeria would not take much of a flood to cover large portions of the entire region. A particularly bad flood would live on mem- in the memory of later generations, and particularly bad floods undoubtedly occurred. In 1929, the English archaeologist Sir Charles Leonard Woolley reported finding water-deposited layers as much as 10 feet thick in his excavations near the Euphrates. Such deposits were not found everywhere in the region, and Sumerian culture showed no overall break. Nevertheless, the evidence exists that somewhere around 3000 BC, there were indeed drastic floods of at least a local nature. Well, isn't that interesting, Bradster? There's absolutely no evidence except for the evidence, but we continue. With time, as the story is told and retold, it is dramatically inevitable that a flood which spreads out over parts of Sumeria and neighboring regions with great loss of life will be said to have covered all the world, meaning the entire region. It is further inevitable that later generations with a much broader knowledge of geography would accept the phrase all the world, literally, and reduce themselves to needless speculation on the impossible. A well-known example of this is the statement frequently met with among the ancient historians, that Alexander the Great conquered the world and then wept for other worlds to conquer. What was meant was merely that Alexander had conquered a large part of those sections of the world which were well known to the Greeks of the time. Actually, Alexander conquered only 4 or 5 percent of the Earth's land surface and had plenty of room in which to extend those conquests. The people of Sumeria and of Acadia told and retold the tale of one particular flood, which may have been produced by unusually heavy rains on the region. Some people suspect the flood to have been too serious to be accounted for by rain alone and think there may have been a sudden rise in the water level of the Persian Gulf, leading to a disastrous influx from the sea. It has occurred to me recently that a possible explanation for such an invasion of the sea would be the unlikely strike of a large meteorite in the near in the nearly landlocked Persian Gulf. A splash that would result would take the form of a huge wave that might move inland catastrophically, sweeping everything away in its path. The invasion of the water from the sea, for whatever reason, is indeed involved in the biblical description of the flood. And he here cites Genesis chapter 7, verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. A tidal wave plus rain in other words. Now, Bradster, here it comes. We're going to have the classic, the classic modern depiction. Professor Asimov says this, in 1872, an English archaeologist, George Smith, deciphered ancient tablets from the remains of a royal Assyrian library and found a description of a flood in which one man saves himself, his family, and samples of animal life on board a ship. The story is based on still older tales dating back to Sumerian time. There it is, Bradster, the modern accusation. If if a story exists outside of the Bible, then it is, of course, nothing more than a retelling of that outside external culture. If it doesn't exist, then there's no evidence outside of the Bible. We have to wonder what's going to actually convince Professor Asimov here of this. What what do you say? Can what, what, Does that seem obvious in, in your mind? And what's going on in your thinking when you hear this continual going to the well in in these ways anything but the truth anything but the truth because we notice that it's not a particular view and remarkably he's talking about the 600 years of noah's life as seeming to be some sort of truth to it coming from someone who doesn't affirm the fairy tale, so to speak, as he would say in Genesis 1-1 of the Bible, that really surprises me. So it seems that he's not trying to be faithful to the text. He's trying to be faithful to himself being a moral man. And I'm not saying this in a negative way, but I'm pretty sure the man would have liked people to think, oh, well, at least he's not just calling it all a lie. He seems to be offering some sort of kindness about this. Maybe somehow, some way outside of that, this man actually did live to be 600 years old and then bump a new narrative off of that. We never know, and I guess we never will. 
little bit of thoughts, but I'll throw it back over to you, JC Bear. Let's continue here, brother, with the text. Professor Asimov says the hero of this tale is Gilgamesh, the king of the Akkadian town of Erech. He is in search of eternal life and finds Ut Napashtim, who has the secret. Ut Napashtim tells his story. It appears that he was king of a Sumerian city at the time of the flood and rowed it out in a large ship. Gilgamesh obtained the secret of eternal life from him, nearly obtained the necessary conditions, and, through misadventure, lost it. The details of this Sumerian flood story are very similar in a number of points to the story in the Bible. It seems quite likely that the biblical story of the flood is a version of this much earlier tale. Bradster, I can't keep track. Which is it? Is there no evidence except for the evidence which exists, which not only includes the evidence of flooding in the archaeological record near the Euphrates River that the one guy found, but also includes the Sumerian text here, which gives us a really interesting, a really interesting story. So is there is there no evidence or is there evidence or is there it's I've, I've given up trying to keep these scorecards for, for when non-believers try to keep set their story straight. But it's very frustrating to hear this denial because. If we accept Professor Asimov's analysis at its face value, then he's actually talking about the evidence that he said earlier was not available. Now think about it. This Ut Napishtim, who is king of a Sumerian city, rides out the flood in a large ship and then gives the secret of eternal life to a visitor who comes to him years later and asks about it. Does that sound an antagonizingly close to what and how Somebody might speak of the gospel of God, the good news, the gift of God is coming, and I have the secret of it, and here it is. Now, of course, not everything matches up. By the way, not everything has to match up, right? Even if this Ut Napishtim were telling his story genuinely versus non-genuinely, that doesn't necessarily invalidate the story. You know, maybe the particular Ut Napishtim that this Gilgamesh is speaking with is either a descendant of or somehow living off of the reputation of that original king who wrote out the flood, quote unquote. What's my point? You said it, Brad. Why is it that at the mention of every single independent fact, the only scenarios that non-believing commentar- commentators are going to consider are the different, the different interpretations that would be supportive of the conclusion that there is no flood? Now, of course, the non-believer can say, well, aren't you doing the same thing when you speculate here that perhaps this story reinforces the biblical flood story? And the answer is not really. I think the, I think the, the text of the Bible stands independently of this interesting historical reference. Having said that, though, it's not the end of the world to find out that other civilizations have these tantalizing stories. It's not the end of the road to find out that there is some evidence for floods. Now, do we have evidence for the particular kind of flood that the Bible is talking about? Well, who is looking and where are they looking? Look, this is not a simple question. People say, well, where is the evidence of the flood? And I'm like, okay, what does the evidence for the flood look like? in a calling card. How would we look for that? How would we establish it? And let's let's have the conversation. What what I think is interesting here is that Professor Asimov has done some research and he's found some interesting his, historical details that may or may not be relevant to the biblical text. Certainly fun to talk about and think about, but that at every stage of the game it looks like he's only going to find narratives that will reject the biblical side of the story. And so that's my take here earlier on. I think we're going to see this continue over and over again. I think again and again, we're going to have these kinds of issues. Any, the ABCs, Bradster, anything but Christ. Let me throw it over to you to just think about that and, and, how, and what that means for us as we continue on in this commentary. It reminds me of that song by Seether, I'm Broken. But no, really, whenever you see all these different pieces that are being put together, We don't have a puzzle on the other side of the fence. When you're talking about non-Christianity, you're talking about a mulligan stew of ideas from all different lots of life that don't agree whatsoever 
a big bang popped in the universe before the universe existed. And now chance has brought forth a great mighty work of all things mysteriously just happening and a early witness to a flood that was finding eternal life and lost it that doesn't have a follow-up of any significance whatsoever. We have Islam, Buddhism, hit and miss, bump and run, offspring of vipers. Who warned you to flee for the wrath to come? That, that's my thought. Whenever we have all these things coming our way, we learn more and more how much the whole world is under sin, unless Christ, who is historical, who is interconnected throughout the whole theme of every book of the Bible, 66 books, 40 plus authors, all making one consistent progressive revelation for you, for me, for whoever is compelled to listen. I'll pass it back over to you, my brother. Professor Asimov continued. He says, in the biblical story, Noah's ark floats on the floodwaters for months. The waters slowly recede. And then he cites Genesis 8, 4. And the ark rested upon the mountains of Ararat. Notice that a specific mountain peak is not named. There is no mention of a Mount Ararat. Instead, the Bible clearly states the mountains of Ararat, implying Ararat to be a nation or nation within which there was a mountain range on which the ark came to rest. If further biblical evidence is needed that Ararat is a region and not a mountain, it can be found in the 51st chapter of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 51, 27. Call together against her, Babylon, the kingdoms of Ararat, Mini and Ashenaz. But where and what was Ararat? Remember that in searching for it, one must consider geography as it was known to those who reduced Genesis to writing, and not necessarily as it was known in the time of the Sumero Akkadian. In Assyrian times, there was a kingdom among the mountains in which the Tigris and Euphrates rose, in what is now eastern Turkey. It centered about Lake Van, and is sometimes called the Kingdom of Van in consequence. The kingdom extended from the lake of the Caucasus Mountains, and in Assyrian ascriptions is referred to as the Kingdom of Urartu, of which the name Ararat is clearly a version. The Kingdom of Urartu was greatly weakened by Assyrian attack, and by 612 BC, it had ceased to exist at a time when Assyria itself was also being destroyed. In the land in which it had existed, new tribesmen arrived, and a new name of Persian origin was given to the land, which became Armenia. Now, Bradster, the professor makes a good point here. When we are accounting for names and places and locations and expectations, the professor's right. We have to consider that to keep all of these names and places and dates in line, we have to have a lot of significant apparatus that we bring to the table about the text itself. Now, that includes not only what we know about the text through its own internal clues, what the text itself says, as well as what the text itself implies, but we also have these extra biblical sources for knowledge and understanding in history. And so it's only in, we, we have a biblical text today only to the degree that we have, we in later periods of time have successfully understood those original, those original languages, what they were speaking of, and we've understood them correctly. One of the interesting issues to go through are, are ideas of how were places mentioned and how did that change over time? I'll give you a great example, my friend. Professor Asimov here is talking about Urat and how he thinks that it's referring to the region that in Assyrian times was known as the kingdom of Urartu, which eventually became what we now know as the, a mo the modern land of Armenia. And so you have to have an understanding of history to even try to reconstruct that and put that back together. And so now we, we do have this section, and let's see where the professor goes with this. He says, the tradition that the Ark came to rest in Ararat speaks again in favor of the tidal wave theory of the flood. Ordinary river flooding would, sl would sweep floating objects downstream, southeastward into the Persian Gulf. A huge tidal wave would, would sweep them upstream, northwest toward Ararat. Now, 
remember the professor has already decided that the biblical flood cannot be global. And so he's got a problem. He's got a problem. What's the problem? It's a local flood, he thinks. But then quite right, rightly, he realizes, how could a local flood take the ark upstream to Ararat? Not only upstream to Ararat, but upstream into the mountain ranges of Ararat. Bradster, do we, have, have we witnessed local flooding in our history, in our lifetimes, in our recorded history? Have we witnessed flooding on a scale where a ship might go from someplace, let's say, at the lower level of the Sumerian Valley up into the mountains of Ararat that are northwest of it, hundreds of miles. Does that sound like a local flood to you? Let me turn it over to you for an idea. Yeah, that's illogical. So why would my counter to a fairy tale be something illogical whenever believing in what is called a fairy tale is actually logical in this sense when you have your laws of logic conflicting in your now in your analysis it really shows a weakness in the overall thought and a lack of trustworthiness and reliability in the narrative much less the source back to you brother now we have an interesting origin story here now moving on from the flood the professor starts talking about one of the three descendants of Noah. And this is the section on Ham. And the professor says, once the flood story is done, the writers of Genesis give names to the descendants of Noah. In almost every case, these represent tribes or nations. It was common for ancient tribes to call themselves after the name of an ancestor, whether real or mythical. In fact, if a tribe was known by some name, it was assumed that it was because the members were descended from an ancestor of that name. The Greeks, for instance, called themselves Hellim and recognized themselves to exist as groups of related tribes called the Aeolians, Dorians, Achaeans, and Ionians. They therefore supposed themselves all to have been descended from a man named Helen. Helen was described as having two sons, Aeolus and Doris, a third son, Zuthus, who had twin sons named Ion and Achaeus. In this spirit, the book of Genesis describes the immediate descendants of Noah, Genesis 9, 18. And the sons of Noah were Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Ham is the father of Canaan. The three sons of Noah represent the three great divisions of the peoples known to the ancient writers of the Bible. In general, the descendants of Shem occupy the Arabian Peninsula and the regions to the north, including the Tigris-Euphrates region. Since this includes the Hebrews themselves, Shem is given the post of honor and is made the eldest son of Noah. At least, he is mentioned first. For this reason, languages of the people dwelling in this region are referred to as Semitic. A Sem is the Greco-Latin form of Shem. So these languages include Hebrew, Assyrian, Aramean, and Arabic. The descendants of Ham are described as living chiefly the corner of Africa, adjacent to Asia. For this reason, the original languages of the people of Northeast Africa are called Hamitic. This includes Coptic, derived from the ancient Egyptian, the Berber languages of North Africa, and some of the languages of Ethiopia, such as Amharic. The descendants of Japheth are described as inhabiting the regions to the north and east of the Tigris-Euphrates. Sometimes, Japhetic is used to describe certain obscure languages. It is a mistake, though, to suppose that the writers of Genesis were influenced by language. Modern notions of philology are strictly modern. Rather, the biblical writers were guided by political connections and geographic propinquity. Such connections often did bespeak racial relatedness, so that terms such as Semitic and Hamitic did turn out to make sense linguistically, but this was not true in every case. A prime example is the case of Canaan. The people inhabiting the land, Canaanites, at the time the Hebrews moved in, spoke a Semitic language and had a culture related to that of the Tigris-Euphrates region. By modern terminology, the Canaanites were distinctly Semites. However, Genesis 9.18 goes out of its way to specify that Ham is the father of Canaan. The reason for that is a simple one. Some three centuries prior to the Hebrew occupation of Canaan, the land had been conquered by Egyptian armies and for a long time formed part of the Egyptian empire. Since Egypt was the most important 
the Hamitic nations, it seemed reasonable to describe Canaan as the son of Ham. The end of the ninth chapter of Genesis relates a tradition in which Noah, offended by his second son, Ham, curses him and condemns him and his son, Canaan, to servitude to his brothers. This reflects the fact that at the time Genesis was being reduced to writing, the Canaanites were indeed reduced to servitude to the Israelites, who were descendants of Shem. Bradster, I don't know if I follow everything the professor says here, but one of the things I want to say is he's reading the text and commenting in a way that's ever so much more faithful than the traditional atheist or anti-theist of our day is doing. And for that, I think I think our non-believing critics owe, owe us an apology and, and owe an apology to even themselves. Uh, Professor Asimov's example of being least somewhat literarily faithful to the text that they're commenting on shows that the professor is indeed, he's more faithful of a critic than we're seeing so typically today. Bradster, what do I mean by this? Well, all sorts of things that come up. It's not uncommon to hear things like there is no evidence for a flood. Now, even Professor Asimov says that earlier here, but then, of course, he, he thankfully contradicts himself later and points out some quite important and possibly persuasive examples of evidence. But what we see today is is that anti-theists or atheists, as they used to be called a generation or two ago, are, are, are simply partisan attack dogs in rejecting the Christian scriptures. And, and that's, really, that's really hindering a better conversation. Look, I'm not saying that the people have to agree with my Christian faith for us to talk about the biblical text, but it does mean that at least Professor Asimov is, one has to be faithful to what the text is saying. How does that strike you when you think about some of the interactions you're having today with folks? Well, we already know that Brother Paul tells us not to engage in meaningless disputes over genealogies and such things like this, and how this interpretation is completely unwarranted and unhelpful. But we do have to admit that he makes his interpretation while somewhat regarding the scriptures themselves. Regarding them uh, will lead to transformation for all those who would come to believe, because we know that you have to have faith from hearing, that it is important, and we do encourage it for that reason. Although we would discourage what is being said here, because it's just unhelpful and fruitless, and not dealing with the actual concepts from the author and the divine creator that worked through this magnificent work, which is known as the Bible. With that, I'll pass it back over to you, my good brother, J.C. the Bear. Thank you, brother. Now, Professor Asimov gives us a really interesting diversion here in this next paragraph. And this was fun to read and even more fun to think about. And I don't think we have to be dogmatic here. Let me just read the paragraph. The Greeks, this is from the section entitled Japheth. The Greeks, it seems, must be considered in biblical terms to be among the descendants of Japheth. The writers of Genesis may even, in this respect, have been influenced by Greek traditions, reaching them dimly from the West. For instance, Japheth himself has been identified by some with the Titan Iapetus in the Greek myths. Since the initial J in Hebrew names is pronounced like a Y in Hebrew, as is the initial I in Greek names, the similarity between Japheth and Iapetus is greater than appears to be in print. Now, let me just take a side direction there. I was really thrown for a loop, Bradster, the first time that I learned that the English name spelled I-A-N, the English name spelled I-A-N, and pronounced to us Ian, was in fact a variation of the gospel name John. That blew my mind the first time I heard that. There's no way that Ian can be just a form of John. But I did the work, I did some research, found out, did some accounting for, for why that might be, and, and satisfied my curiosity that such is the case. And so now, when I see somebody named Ian, I see that there's a connection now the, to, the, to the Christian Christianized name that we in modern English typically call John. And so similarly, according to the Greek myths, so first of all, Iapetus could just as easily be Japheth, in which case that sounds very similar to Japheth. Now, 
how far do we take similar sound sounding names? And even if we take similar sounding names, um, I think everybody should just know that that doesn't necessarily mean that because we see a Japetus in Greek myths and a Japheth in the biblical record, that they're necessarily the same person. After all, there can be there can be more than one people with the same name. And so this is just fun to think about, though. According to the Greek myths, Japetus was the father of Prometheus, who in turn fathered the human race by molding them out of clay. For this reason, Japetus was considered by the Greeks to be the ancestor of mankind. And to the Hebrews, Japheth was the ancestor of that portion of mankind to which the Greeks belong. Now, Bradster, I'm not claiming this is proof, but this is awfully interesting, these kinds of tie-ins that you can find. The professor continues, the sons and grandsons of Japheth are listed in the 10th chapter of Genesis. Genesis 2, the sons of Japheth, Gomer and Magog and Madai and Javan and Tubal and Meshach and Tiras, and the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz and Ripath and Togarma, and the sons of Javan, Elisha and Tarshish, Kitim and Dodanim. We must remember that such genealogies reflect the geographic and political situation of the Assyrian period when the various parts of Genesis were reduced to writing. Of the sons of Japheth, Gomer seems to be identified with the people who in Assyrian descriptions were the Gemari, and these people were the known in the Latin spelling as the Cimmerian. In earlier times, they lived north of the Black Sea, but in 7th century BC, they pushed on Pushed on by new bands of barbarians in their rear, they invaded Asia Minor and met the Assyrians there in earth-shaking battles. They were eventually defeated, to be sure, but Assyria was badly wounded in the process. The Cimmerians would certainly be in prominent view at the time of the 10th chapter was being written, and their eponym, Gomer, could very reasonably be viewed as the firstborn of Japheth. By the way, I'm taking us out of the Bible and out of Professor Asimov's commentary for just a moment. When, when the modern creator created the idea, when Robert E. Howard created this idea of Conan the Barbarian, now this is a modern creation. <laughs> this is not a historical, this is not a historical person. But when he came up with this idea of Conan the Barbarian, at one point in time, I, th I remember reading somewhere that he was Conan the Kimmerian. And so if you think of that movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger in it, and then imagine that we are talking about a descendant of one of the sons of Japheth. It's interesting to think about or consider, not in the sense that we're talking about the actual history, but in the sense that it helps you relate the time frame, the geography, and the people group. Then it starts to make these people come, become more alive. Now, as for Magog, Professor Asimov continues, that may represent the land of Gog, where Gog is known to us from the Greek historians as Gyges. He was king of the Lydians in Western Asia Minor and was one of the important adversaries of the invading Cimmerians. In fact, he died in battle against them about 652 BC. Medai is supposed to refer to the Medes, who inhabited the territory east of Assyria, who were soon to be among the final conquerors of Assyria. Tubal, Meshach, and Tiras are all thought to represent minor tribes of Asia Minor. The name Tiras bears some similarities to the Greek Tirsinoi, which applied to a people who, it thought, dwelt originally in Asia Minor, but migrated to Italy. If so, Tiras could represent the Etruscans. Now, brother, I know to somebody who, who's not familiar with history, these names might sound dry, but I can tell you, the Bible and the other understanding of history that I have from antiquity does not talk about does not talk about human human tribes existing in this hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of years time frames with these just hundreds of thousands of descendants uh, various generations. This reads to me like a young earth. This reads to me like a small group of tribalistic people spreading out over this unpeopled earth and populating and filling it. And you want to talk today, we, we joke about small towns. One of the things about, one of the, the downsides of living in a small town is that everybody knows everybody else. And of course, the joke is everybody is related to everybody else. But think of how much more so it's true here. 
we're talking about the Cimmerians. We're talking about the Medes, who will eventually become the Medo-Persians. We're talking about the Tirsinoi, who perhaps might represent the Etruscans, who are the pre-Roman occupants in Tuscany, in Italy. Bradster, wow, what a, what a story of origin. And then the professor says this, the most interesting of the sons of Japheth is Javan. This name is almost certainly identical with an archaic form of the Greek Ion, who is the eponym of the Ionian Greek. The Ionians had, about 1000 BC, migrated eastward to occupy the islands of the Aegean Sea and the coasts of Asia Minor. Of the various Greek tribes, they were the nearest to Canaan and would be the best known to the Israelites of Assyrian tri times. Of Gomer's sons, Ashkenaz, may be identical with the name Ashguza found among Assyrian inscriptions. This seems to refer to the people known to the Greeks and to ourselves as the Scythians. The Scythians were nomadic tribes who entered Europe from somewhere in Central Asia sometime before 1000 BC. It was their pressure southward against the Cimmerians that drove the Cimmerians into Asia Minor. And so think here of Conan the Barbarian being out barbarian by these Scythians. And so the Scythians took their place in the steppe lands north of the Black Sea. And from that standpoint, Ashkenaz, Scythia, might well be considered the eldest son of Gomer, Cimmeria. Now, interesting hi history lesson. What is that region called today? That region on the steppe lands north of the Black Sea, where the Cimmerians lived and the Scythians came and fought them. Well, that would be part of modern day Ukraine. Bradster, Bradster, this world, it's all tied together. We are all related to each other. We are all part of the same family of God. We all go back to this biblical story. Now, Professor Asimov says this, for some reason, the later Jews viewed Ashkenaz as the ancestor of the Teutonic people. For this reason, German-speaking Jews were called Ashkenazi, as contrasted with Spanish-speaking Sephardim. Now, Bradster, I'm not a historian. I'm not passing on the historical accuracy of everything here. I think history is quite an involved subject, and I think there are few historians who are willing to go out on a limb and claim something close to certainty for an exact knowledge of how these things unfolded in antiquity and who's related to whom. But at the very least is this, the biblical text at least says what it says. And amazingly enough, even an atheist like Professor Asimov is able to go through and associate almost all of these names with potential candidates for people groups who might be descendants of that biblical of the, of the biblical person being mentioned. Bradster, that sounds like evidence. Sounds like evidence that the Bible is true, at least to those degrees. And how, how, how are we doing? Bradster, how did we go from no evidence to all of a sudden the Bible having in it the kinds of mention of people groups that can anchor down our entire historical understanding of antiquity? How can the professor affirm both of those things simultaneously. What's going on in his mind, my friend? Yeah, that's a good question. What is going on in his mind? One thing that I notice is if you stay close to the narrative of the Bible, you'll prove yourself to be a contradiction. But if you jump far away from it, then everybody goes up in the air with their hands and nobody can really establish anything significant. But with this method, they say, who knows? Who cares? It turns out that we care. We care quite a bit. And of course, this breaks the normative means of being an atheist. Because if you're going to go down this rabbit hole, you'll be made a fool of in many different ways. And if you'll switch it up and say, well, you know what? Everything's been around for a million years, 10 million years, 10 billion years, however many years that disagree with a good narrative that demonstrates truth of ancestry and archaeological findings, actual meaningful interaction, then we're free, so to speak, to believe anything we want. And that's the ultimate goal that most partake and run from such an endeavor as this. So I applaud the man for at least trying, at least somewhat following the main narrative. But 
we all know that to actually follow the main narrative, you learn as much more than a fairy tale. Back to you. My friend, what a beautiful and interesting journey. And Professor Asimov continues. I would I would love to just, just continue reading with this here. I think we'll we'll cut it short for time constraints for this discussion. But I want to applaud the professor for doing the thing that is so missed in today's criticisms of the biblical text, which is to actually engage with the text. Now, what do we know about our history based on what the Bible gives us? Well, it's hard to say with certainty. Some people want to dismiss what the Bible says as being not true uh, with regard to the historical lineages, with regard to the people groups, with regards to the kinds of adventures in trying to trying to piece back the history of the region. Now, we have to be careful in our modern couch, sitting comfortably, looking back at maps, looking back at historical lists that have come to us from various tribes, from various people groups over thousands of years. This knowledge is vast. It is epic. It is dispersed. It is amazing. And yet, it fits only in a few thousand years. Some Christians like to to read the scriptures and hold to an old age for the earth. Typically, that's so that they can be theistic evolutionists of some sort. I'm not throwing those people out of, of the faith, but I just say this. When I read these scriptures, I don't get that feel. Now, I get it. Feel is not a scientific quantity, but when I read the history as the Bible describes it, it feels small. It has this immediacy to it. It has this very extremely personal characteristic that that maybe we in a modern age are almost starting to lose as we think of, so for example, do we, do we think of ourselves as Americans in the same way? I, I, I have find it very difficult. I live in a land of 300 plus million Americans, and I, I don't have that connection with with people on that scale of 300 million. And yet, if I wrote down my own history, if I told my life's story, I could see it sounding very similar in terms of the the people it mentions, the places that it mentions. You know, it sounds to me like the biblical story is the story of an unfolding human family as it becomes a tribe, as it becomes a clan, as those clans eventually branch out into larger people groups, and as eventually uh, it comes over the entire world. And so, Bradster, what an interesting quantity to think about. And, and I think there's a time and place to try to go through this more. We're just, we're just pushing our time limit here. So let me throw it over to you, my friend, for some final thoughts about today's discussion. Well, the one thing that I know that stands out the most is this is being dealt with. It could have been passed up, but I think deep down the man knows that he's suppressing the truth. He knows that there is great evidence here. He would not feel the need to go in great detail with something that is meaningless and ridiculous and nonsensical as what he portrays so much for the Bible to be with his retellings. But we see just the opposite. We see, hey, here's another way of looking at that supports our schools of thought, reasoning, and maybe there is some truth. So we don't have to completely dismiss these religious people with their religious book. And that's a step up from what we see in modern times as of now. The last thing anyone would want to do is even open up the scriptures for a single second. And with that, I congratulate this man. And, and with that, I'll throw it back over to you, brother. Now, it was, it was a common joke or trope when I was younger that there was nothing more boring than going to somebody's house and having them show you all of their vacation photographs. Now, I, I can verify that that is often the case. <laughs> so I have, I have gone to social functions where he has pulled out their smartphone and spent the next hour showing me each and every one of their vacation photos. Uh, here, here they are. Here they are standing on the balcony. Here they are waving. Here they are waving with person number one. Here they are waving with person number two. And yes, that gets old very quickly. But as somebody who is interested in the human family, I am I'm intensely engaged with the biblical text here. 
I don't always know what to make of those names there. I don't hold that against the scriptures. I hold that against me, of course. But the parts that I do catch really do strengthen my faith, Bradster, really do convince me that the world is a young one, that the human family is in the time of antiquity, in the time of these writings, these scriptures are reflecting that the world was in some sense a much smaller world where people knew everybody and people were involved in everybody's business in a way that is perhaps being lost to us nowadays as we live in these modern and postmodern worlds of billions. Brad Bradster, there are, there are almost 8 billion people alive on the world now, and I perhaps have a direct connection with, what would it be, less than one-tenth of one percent of all of them. And yet we share this beautiful world at exactly this same time. If the Earth had an older age, such as many old Earth creationists want to suggest, then I'd expect, I'd expect the same kind of engagement to be roughly similar just 4,000 to 6,000 years ago in the time frames that we're considering here in Genesis. That is to say, I'd expect the text to be reflecting something along the lines of, you know, we're a nation of so many hundreds of millions, or, 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 or we are a nation with tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of descendants, and uh, we're not seeing that. Now, that's not proof. It's just, it's just me explaining about how I engaged with the text over the decades. That's me trying to talk out what it means when I say it has a feel of a young earth. And so that's interesting to think about. And, and brother, thank you for your thoughts and contributions here. If it's all right, I'll close us with a prayer. Heavenly Father, what is the truth of the human story? Father, in these confused days, it's tempting to think that we will never have a full and rich understanding of the true way that human history is unfolded in the world. But Lord, we come to you praising you for the biblical text. Lord, we thank you. It speaks gloriously. It speaks truly, speaks authoritatively. And Lord, as the scriptures say, let God be true, even though every man be a liar. Let your words be vindicated, Lord God. We praise you and honor you for them. Lord, we thank you for this chance to look through this text. We thank you for Professor Asimov, who wrote it, Lord, and gave us so many examples of the kinds of situations that we see non-believers facing today. Lord, we pray for them. We thank you for them. We ask you, Lord, that you would open their eyes, that you would grant wisdom. Lord, that you would pour out your Spirit upon all flesh, as you have done, Lord. Lord, we validate and affirm that you are good. We worship and praise you as God, as holy. And be with us, Lord, in this day. In Jesus' name, amen.